coming up. Your uh, organization issued a, a fairly damning uh, press release about the budget. Uh, what is the uh, Business Council's position on the increase in the capital gains inclusion rate? We'll start with uh, some of the claims that the government has made with respect to the capital gains uh, increase. One of, the, one of their claims is that uh, only 0.13% of Canadians and that 99.87% uh, of people will be exempt from this, uh, from this tax. Is, is, what's your, what is your, uh, what does the Chamber of Commerce feel about that? Canada will not even be close to that. I didn't say that though, Mr. Souza. Given that Canada's productivity has declined significantly, in fact, it's gone down 2% according to the OECD when the United States has gone up 8% since 2015. I wonder what happened in 2015. Do you think it's disingenuous for this government to present money it's already owed to these businesses as new funds? And it was mentioned today to you that neither productivity or innovation suffered. In fact, Canada experienced the highest productivity and innovation at that time with the, with the tech boom of the 1990s. So tell me, how do I, how do I square that? Simple, a simple and fair and principled tax system. Would you agree with the characterization that this is economic vandalism on the part of the Liberal government? Is there anything that you would, that is really pressing that you would like to share with us um, today, given that you had asked to return? This guy's garage. Like and subscribe. Mr. Greco, uh, perhaps I'll start with you. I have in front of me a letter that was written uh, May 9th, uh, signed by Mr. Beattie, yes. the uh, head of uh, the um, Canadian Chamber of Commerce. And in the letter, he comments at length about the uh, budget that was delivered, and in particular, the, the increases in the capital gains inclusion rate. Uh, which are in self-regulatory in nature, as the Income Tax is, Act is. In the letter he says, as, as national industry associations representing Canadian companies committed to growing our economy, investing in this country and creating more opportunities for Canadians, we are alarmed to see these goals threatened by Budget 2024's proposed increase in the capital gains inclusion rate. The increase in the inclusion rate is to 67% is deeply concerning to Canada's business community writ large. He goes on on this type of line of argument, and then he says the assertion that the increase in the inclusion rate to 67% will only affect a small percentage of wealth, wealthiest Canadians is misleading. I point out that he signed it, and along with him, signatories are Dan Kelly from the CFIB, uh, Mr. Arby from Canadian Manufacturers and Exporters, Kim Furlong from Can Canadian Venture Capital, Sherry McNeil from the Canadian Franchise Association, and Dave Carey from the Canola Growers Association. Do you stand by those comments made by Mr. Beattie? Yes, we do. And so I think uh, there's a few things. I think the tax increase, I think, is a series of new taxes that build a lot of in uncertainty and investment. Um, I can tell you one example. Um, I One of the small manufacturers that I deal with um, you know, have, is now caught in the middle of the capital gains tax. He uh, was looking at doing an expansion and, and he was dealing with a secession. Um, and as a result now, because of the capital gains tax increase and just, and how he's caught in that threshold, um, now he has to relook at his secession plan and he has to look at new investments in machinery, equipment, and technology. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, we want a competitive tax, a uh, competitive business environment, but we can't have, you know, a, a series of web of carve outs and different caveats. We need to look at, any our tax and spend politics and really look at broad-based tax reform and I to ensure innovation growth that. and investment. And, uh, I, I hate to cut you off. I just I want to make sure we get... I have a few more questions I want to make sure that we get in. One of the things that is um, of great concern is this point about this, the um, small percentage yep. of people. So I, I think it's important for politicians of all political stripes to understand that, that most small businesses are not sole proprietorships. In other words, people don't own them, the assets directly. They're owned through companies. This um, uh, change is inherently unfair because you can have two exactly the same, same businesses. You can have a hair salon that's owned as a sole proprietorship right next to one that's owned in a small business corporation. One gets the $250,000 exemption and the other doesn't. So if you count those people who are no different 
they're no different than the sole proprietors. It's way, way higher, is it not? Yeah. Absolute, absolutely yeah. it is. But I think that's why we have to look at simplifying the tax system as a whole. It's why we've called for comprehensive tax reform for the interests of Canadians. And, and otherwise, if we have to look ourselves, not only when we look at fairness, it has to look at for all sizes of businesses, generational fairness, and we have to look at what actions we want to take today so we're not sacrificing ac economic opportunity and, and prosperity. So I think it's important to understand that this change was made by way of a motion, not by a law. There will be implementing legislation that will come probably in the fall. Is it the intention of the um, Canadian Chamber of Commerce to stridently argue that the government should withdraw these changes and not make an increase to the capital gains inclusion rate. Is that the position uh -huh. of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce? Will they do that? Yes, it is. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, um, if I might change, switch uh, in the time I have left, Mr. Chair, uh, to Ms. Jones. Uh, same questions to you. Um, your uh, organization issued a, a fairly damning uh, press release about the budget. Uh, what is the uh, Business Council's position on the increase in the capital gains inclusion rate. Do you plan to stridently argue against it uh, before the uh, implementat implementation legislation is brought by the government? We're still looking at the capital gains inclusion rate. Um, certainly have heard from some members, particularly in the biotech uh, sector, that they have concerns. So we'll be looking carefully at that. And our broader concern in terms of um, What's going on uh, in our, our 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 budget is that the GDP per capita um, numbers are looking very bleak in uh, Canada, and that's a great and, point. Um, and, uh, we've lost a decade. Yeah. That's a great point. And, and let me ask you this question. Do you think that given the weak productivity that we have in terms of per capita GDP, that increasing the capital gains tax at the time that we have such weak productivity is a good idea? We would be concerned about raising any taxes at a time where um, we are uh, concerned about attracting investment to the country. Thank you very much. Those are my questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I'm going to follow up a little bit on the questions that were asked uh, by my colleague, Mr. Morant. And so um, I want to talk specifically, we'll start with uh, some of the claims that the government has made with respect to the capital gains uh, increase. One of, the, one of their claims is that uh, only 0.13% of Canadians and that 99.87% uh, of people will be exempt from this uh, from this tax. Is is what's your what is your uh, what does the Chamber of Commerce feel about that? And and also, what are you hearing from your members? I think we're hearing from our members. I think there's a lot of frustration right now in terms of the, the these of of carve outs being happening with these tax and spend policies. Frankly, I think you know there's a. I think we all want to have fairness in the tax system. We understand that there needs to be taxes that are paid, but as a result of, of this tax, there's a risk of losing productivity, losing investment to the south of the border at a time where in 12 out of the last uh, uh, 15 quarters, our productivity numbers are done. We've virtually had almost no GDP growth. Right. And our GDP per capita, depending on which metric you used, is down seven out of eight quarters, uh, which is really our income per Canada for Canada and uh, just to maybe further on that uh, what uh, what do you what does your organization what do your members think the impact of the capital gains tax will be on productivity and GDP per growth per right capital. now I don't think it's I don't, I, it doesn't help it at all right now and I think right now the fact is going back to 2018 the level of productivity we're back to where we were back then and then we've had no growth. We, as I mentioned in my remarks, we're the second lowest in the OECD in terms of business investment. And when you look at the ease of doing business according to the World Bank, we were sixth in 2006. Now we're 23rd. Yeah, so we've got some difficulty. Speaking of ease of doing business, one of the, the I think the underreported stories with respect to the capital gains exemption is how much more how much more complicated uh, that the government has made it. Uh, um, so, for example, if in fact you sell your business, you're going to pay uh, uh, at least four different inclusion rates and probably a couple of marginal rate tax difference. So on one transaction, you could be paying tax at six or seven different rates. Uh, it, and uh, so you, because you've got cap gains exemption, the 250K exemption, you've got the Canada Canadian Entrepreneurship, and then you've got the, the full rate. Uh, do you, do your... What's your organization's uh, thoughts with respect to the current complicated state of the Income Tax Act and uh, the capital gains increase and in making it more complicated? 
Well, I, I th we feel that the tax system is completely too complicated. It's why we've called for comprehensive tax reform. And I think it, it, having a royal commission to be able to develop on that and look at it and focus on outcomes-based measures. Right now, with the tax system as it is, SMEs are not encouraged to be able to grow and scale up. Right? They should be rewarded in terms of if you're willing to invest. And with, the different, with how the Income Tax Act is structured right now, there's no incentive because then they're paying more taxes. Whereas when you go to another U.S. state with lower taxes, the more incentivized on top of different incentives that they have made available with the Inflation Reduction Act and other um, avenues to help them do business. One, one, of the, one of the challenging or issues that I've seen that's uh, most troublesome is actually not the technical provisions, but sort of the attitudinal direction of this government. You've heard this really like ramped up, torqued up rhetoric about uh, uh, about. Uh, about people who are successful, um, who are being demonized, business owners, job creators. Those are some of your members, uh, and uh, many of them aren't rich. Um, if, in fact, and I want to get those specifics here, so if, in fact, your members had more capital, isn't it correct, Mr. Greco, that they would use that money to create jobs, reinvest in the economy, and even make additional charitable donations? It's not just jobs, it's also investment in machinery, equipment, and technology, particularly in manufacturing. We look at automation, but this has to be a, a whole, it can't be a partisan affair. All different parties have to be able to come together to make this happen. If we don't have job, if we don't have jobs, it affects Canadians in terms of getting their, whether an appliance delivered in Quebec or be able to get good essential goods they need in the event we have either future crises or just even simple food and, and other basics for Canadians to be able to deliver. So, it, yeah. In the past, the Chamber of Commerce, amongst other business organizations, has been successful in backing uh, progressive liberal uh, governments off of some of these uh, punitive measures they put in place uh, to hurt the economy and ultimately the most vulnerable. Um, could you tell us, do you have any plans uh, to launch websites, to have media campaigns? Uh, and if you don't, uh, I, think, I think now would be the time to start. And you've got uh, five Liberal members here. Uh, you should tell them exactly the impact this is going to have on the Canadian economy. I think we've like got enough time for a yes or no answer. <laughs> <laughs> We're working on it. Thanks. Mr. Sousa, go ahead, please. <clears throat> Um, well, thank you for the opportunity to have a discussion about being competitive. Yeah. That's the whole point. Absolutely. Try to lessen the cumulative burden on regulation, but at the same time, enhance the ability for Canada to be an attractive place to invest. We have been a pretty top destination for FDI, foreign direct investment. We have accumulated quite a number of investment outside of Canada to come here. We are trying to nurture and monetize and, and scale up um, local companies and businesses to succeed and compete internationally. Uh, and that also means having a carbon pricing system in place that enables us to compete because of trade requirements, because they're built into the trade requirements to have carbon pricing put in. We are doing what we can to try to improve ourselves internationally or through interprovincial issues. And I'm thinking now specifically of a cooperative securities regulator, for example, where we try to bring all the provinces together to have one capital structure to be competitive. And, of course, politics get in the way, different elections happen from different provinces. So... We're, I, we're on side with making Canada competitive. We're on side with making Canada safe. Yep. At the same time, we're on Canada. We're on. We're we're on the same page. I believe you are yeah. to not have political interference when it comes to regulation, sure. like the Bank of Canada, or the Ontario Securities Commission, or the provincial uh, regulatory systems. Right? We brought in FISRA, Financial Services Regulatory Authority, yep. from Fisco, arm's length to keep political interference and rhetoric out of the system to protect the interests of consumers as well, because there's that built into it. So we're all trying to do that. And your recommendations are good. Those recommendations made uh, by the other witnesses were also important, because yeah. dialogue is important here. 100%. So tell me, do you know what the proposed capital gains rate is going to be for the United States? Do you know what they're doing? Are you aware of what our competitor is trying to do with capital gains relative to what Canada is doing? Well, I understand, I, I understand what you're saying, but I also think you can't, you can't just look at the capital gains. You have to look at everything else that the United Absolutely. States is Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's why I started my, how I premised my question. Right. Canada is doing quite a bit. But on the issue of capital gains that is being put towards you, are you aware of what the United States is proposing to do on that issue? 
Well, the United, well, here's the thing, though, about what's happening with the United States right now. They're looking at, they've had much more incentives around the Inflation Reduction Act, which has which put, and yes, Canada has tried to respond, but when it comes to Canada, the United States, you can't just look at one single Mr. Greco, yeah. we've been doing a great job with inflation, we're battling <laughs> it, and we're keeping arm's length away from the, the Bank of Canada, uh, the governor, because we don't want to interfere with them. My question back to you again, what is the United States proposing to do with capital gains on that one issue? What are they proposing to do? In terms of being competitive with Canada, what are they going to do? But I don't think you can look at one single... I'm asking you that one particular question, Mr. Greco. What are they going to do? I, I, again, I think the, the reality is you can't just look at one single tax measure. <laughs> but you are looking at it when you're responding to the question of regards to capital gains. 33% of capital gains is tax-free in Canada or will be continuing to be so. 50% of that will still be tax-free for... for Revenues up to 250000 or more annually, not just at a one-time basis. And, of course, entrepreneurs are going to get $1.25 million lifetime exemption in the sale of their business. So we are trying to be competitive, especially with the United States, because they're increasing their capital gains tax rate to 45%. Canada will not even be close to that. Having said that, though, Mr. Souza, like I know a lot of uh, – not the one example I mentioned on, on SMEs, though – like there, there are a number of small businesses that are captured into the capital gains tax that had a plan to invest, and now they're having to look at scrambling in terms of looking at different succession plans, looking at the different tax structures. So, and these SMEs are not necessarily they're not wealthy, they're not the richest of Canadians, and they're trying to make ends meet. We need to support. Sorry, how much? I'm not sure how much time I have, Mr. <laughs> Chair. We need to support them. We need to support SMEs. We need to support entrepreneurs. We need to support startups in Canada. We need to enable them to succeed. And in so doing, we need to provide, and we are offering a number of other opportunities to support that. Um, partly, in doing so, we have had exemptions and we've had some tax reductions well beyond that in the United States for SMEs. And your point about the escalation from SME to corporate and that tax different differentiation that you were referencing earlier, those are things that we need to support as we go forward. Yeah. But I'm just trying to remind you that Canada needs to be competitive on all fronts. And those issues are being taken into consideration as we proceed. And the, exclu and the inclusionary rate provides for a huge benefit at the 250 mark and 500,000 if they have double, uh, you know, if it's husband and wife on entrepreneurs, but the beneficial ownership that is not applied to trusts and to uh, small businesses, that'll still be a 33% tax-free benefit, I th I think which will be well I'm afraid well to interrupt that it's our time. <laughs> with the United States, is my point. <laughs> Increasing dividend income and capital gains taxes from 20% to 39.6% uh, for households earning over $1 million would raise government revenue by about 5% and GDP by about 1% in the long term. Uh, it goes on to say at the end, because dividend income and capital gains are enjoyed largely by the wealthiest members of society, increasing taxes on income from these sources can play a crucial role in mitigating income and wealth inequality. Here's a question. Is mitigating income and wealth inequality one of the goals of your organization? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. We want, we, only, we want prosperity for the prosperity of all Canadians. We but this is, we're not talking about prosperity. We're talking specifically about income inequality and wealth inequality, both of which are known to be corrosive to society. Like, how, how can your organization not care about we do care widening about wealth inequality? We, 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 no, we care about actually in terms of wealth. We want wealth. And no, prosperity. no, not wealth. Hey, not Mr. wealth. Backrack. Wealth inequality. Mr. Backrack, you're past your time. I'm trying to allow <laughs> to answer, but you're past your time. Just a quick answer, Mr. Greco, and then we'll move on to Mr. Morantz. All us is we want wealth and prosperity for all Canadians. Thanks. Mr. Morantz? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Greco, um, just uh, let's go straight up. Um, the government says, the finance minister says that the increase in the capital gains inclusion rate will only affect 0.13% of Canadians. Do you think that's an accurate statement? Based on examples that we've heard from members of all different sizes of companies, it's more just going to affect a small yeah. amount of people. Yeah. And let's talk about the relationship between productivity mm -hmm. and risk-taking. Because really that's the nub of the question. When you increase the capital gains tax, that is essentially a tax on productivity, is it not? 
Well, I think it's it's it, it's not it doesn't help. I mean, Canada's productivity is the worst it's been since the nineteen nineties, mm-hmm. and we're putting and as a result, yeah. we put our not only our prosperity at risk, but we also provide our living standards at risk. And simply put, I think something yeah. needs to change if we're going to jumpstart yeah. economic growth. Now, the finance minister likes to argue that well, it's not fair that somebody who's working pays tax on one hundred percent of their income, but that somebody who makes an investment takes a risk and makes a capital gain pay, doesn't pay tax on 100% of that income. That, that, they see that as being inherently unfair. And you know what, I'm willing to give uh, some openness to hearing that argument. I mean, on the face of it, it seems that way. But the reality is, is it not, that if you, the end result of that argument is that if you were to make 100% of a capital gain taxable, say the inclusion rate was 100%, what effect do you think that would have on risk taking across multiple sectors of industry in Canada? I think, simply put, if you have any series of new taxes or anything that builds that makes it more difficult to do business, it builds it builds uncertainty, it stifles investment, and it signals to the world do business elsewhere. That's something yeah. we can't have. And when people take risks, there's a risk that they could lose. Correct. There's, yeah, there's always, a, in our entrepreneurial culture, there's always, a, you, every, I know we know a number of businesses that take risks every day to be able to grow and expand their businesses. Yeah, or they could make a profit. Yeah, there's a risk yeah. of profit so or loss. So, yeah. t- so it's, it's, it's different than just earning a salary at a job, is it not? Well, it, there's a, it takes a lot to be able to start a business. Yeah, and lots of businesses fail, do they not? Businesses fail, there's, yeah. and that's the risk of yeah. entrepreneurship. So if you said uh, there's a young business person just deciding for the first time they want to invest in a business, um, and you said to them, well, 100% of your gain is going to be taxable, just like if you were earning a salary, do you think they would be more likely or less likely to make that investment? I think simply put, any additional new taxes uh, puts a risk on additional investments being made in Canada. Yeah. And given that Canada's productivity has declined significantly, in fact, it's gone down 2% according to the OECD when the United States has gone up 8% since 2015. I wonder what happened in 2015. But uh, yeah, Canada is heading in the wrong direction in terms of productivity. Shouldn't, shouldn't we at the very least not be making it more expensive for risk takers to take those risks? You want to be the, more, the less expensive it is, more com- uh, businesses have a chance to succeed and want to do business in Canada. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Those are my questions. The last time uh, the Chamber of Commerce was here, on April 10th, I asked you a question on the impact of $2.5 billion that was promised in carbon tax revenues that was not returned to small businesses since 2019. In Budget 2024, the Minister of Finance stated that she has now created the new Canada carbon rebate for small businesses, which will now return this $2.5 billion to small and medium-sized businesses. Do you think it's disingenuous for this government to present money it's already owed to these businesses as new funds? Thank you for the question, Ms. Cousy. I think at the end of the day, we will look at how it is to be more affordable for Canadians. I think what we've said is any for carbon, any carbon tax revenue for SMEs, it has to be re- returned back to revenue for to help with machinery, equipment, technology to help small businesses be able to grow. Um, at the end of the day, though, there needs to be if we're not having affordability in the minds of Canadians, it's a challenge. But at the end of the day, we do have companies that have made investments for net zero, and that has to be protected as well. Thank you. I think, unfortunately, this is a theme uh, with this government. Are you concerned that this will be a one-time commitment and the government will not continue to return what is owed to Canadian small businesses because it does not provide a future path within this budget? I think at the I think at the end of the day, it's just it goes back to what I said. It's about affor- afford- it's about affordability and everything we're talking about today. It needs to go back to our overall tax system as a whole. If we don't do comprehensive tax reform then we won't have companies be able to prosper and grow. It's long past due to do that. Another 
organization that has testified at this committee, the CFIB, has stated that small businesses pay about 40% of the carbon tax, but are only eligible for approximately 5% of the rebates. This is already a decrease from the previous 9% that they could claim. In your opinion, how would this impact Canada's productivity and the ability for small businesses to grow? I think I think at the end of the day, you have to look at not just taxing, you have to look at all the different mechanisms in terms of permitting, in terms of the regulatory environment, in terms of, in, of investment supports, in terms of other mechanisms to help governments to be, uh, do get be able to succeed, help Canadians succeed. And at the end of the day, I don't think you need to have envir- environmental outcomes and financial outcomes for businesses to be sacrificed. I think everything can be able to go together. But it requires a whole comprehensive approach, as I said, for tax and regulatory reform. In another recent CFIB survey, uh, 82 to 85 percent of members were against the carbon tax. 56 percent of small businesses said that they will need to raise their prices. 45 percent said they need to freeze or reduce their wages. And 33 percent have less capacity to invest in environmental initiatives and reduce their emissions, something that this uh, government has tried to claim as their flagship. Do you feel this carbon tax is effective when it's only increasing costs on small businesses and preventing a third of businesses from investing and reducing their emissions? I think, I think at the end of the day, Ms. Kuzevi, when you look at investments for small businesses, I, I just think they need to have a, simple, a better environment to do business in Canada, simply put. Yeah. In your opinion, how will the continued increase in the carbon tax impact Canada's current cost of living crisis when 56% of small businesses are raising prices while also freezing or reducing wages? I think, again, um, it's looking at a much more competitive business environment for Canadians. At the end of the day, it, if, I think at the end of the day, government has to be able to get out of the way, make it easier to do business. It's about getting the fundamentals right for Canadian businesses to succeed. Uh, I'll turn back to the um, questions as raised by my colleagues in the first two rounds. In a letter to the Minister of Finance on May 9th, the Chamber of Commerce stated that generational fairness should consider the actions we are taking today at the expense of our future prosperity. You also state that this measure will not, um, pardon me, this measure will limit opportunities for all generations and make Canada a less competitive and less innovative nation. What specifically will be impacted by the increase of the capital gains tax? I think when you look at generational fairness, you have to consider the actions we are taking today. And, and, it, and, it, and based on what has been proposed, it's, it's at the expense of our future prosperity and our economic opportunity, right? I think we've, we've had a point right now, we've had a lot of complicated different tax measures, different carve-outs, different caveats, and that's just made, I think we have to get away from that. Otherwise, we're undermining innovation and growth in Canada. So in your opinion, will this only impact Canada's most wealthy or will this impact middle class Canadians as well? In our, in our conversations with members, we have a number of small businesses that have been affected by this. And, they have their, and it's, so it's not just the wealthiest of Canadians. It is, it, is, it is affecting small businesses who are trying to look at new investments in Canada and are not part of the wealthy 1%. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Kusi. Mr. Kuzmerchuk, please. Thank you, Chair. I, I wanted to talk actually about the red tape reduction study, but I'm going to bite on this uh, conversation here that we're having. Uh, the average pay of the uh, top 100 CEOs in Canada is about $14.9 million. It is uh, 246 times the average worker salary in Canada. So we hear a lot about uh, fairness. Uh, we, t- we hear a lot about fairness today. Uh, And we also heard about uh, inequality. So explain to me how I can explain to a nurse or a teacher or an electrician or a carpenter in my writing why their salary, their employment income is taxed at 100% of their income is subject to tax. Whereas a top CEO earning $14.9 million and who has investments in stocks and that they're selling or real estate or cottages, that those capital gains are only taxed or subject to 50%. Uh, Explain, help me to explain that to my residents, how that is fair. That a worker, like a nurse, a teacher, a carpenter, a welder, 
100% of their employment income is taxable, is subject to tax, whereas a CEO that is earning $14.9 million, 246 times the average salary of an average worker in Canada, why their investments, whether stocks or real estate, is only subject, only 50% of those investments of that profit is subject to tax. How is that fair, sir? I think you have to look at overall gener generational fairness. I don't, I don't look at picking and choosing. It's about what, what this means for everyone and about what we look at at a future. Like I know a number of small business owners who are not part of the wealthiest Canadians and have made invests that are caught, up, are, are, are caught up in this. I, don't, I think at the end of the day, though, I think we have to get away from you know, these carve-outs. I think we have to look at what's fair for all Canadians. And that's where it goes back to what I said earlier. It's about a, com a comprehensive tax reform that we have desperately needed, something that our organization has called for to help all Canadians and all businesses for communities. It's not about one group or the other. Sir, we had a much more fair capital gains system under Prime Minister, Conservative Prime Minister Brian Mulroney when the capital gains inclusion rate was 75%, the highest in history. And it was mentioned today to you that neither productivity or innovation suffered. In fact, Canada experienced the highest productivity and innovation at that time with the, with the tech boom of the 1990s. So tell me, how do I, how do I square that? Simple, a, a simple and fair and principled tax system that works in the best interest of Canadians is the way to go. It's why I think we need a, non, a nonpartisan of effort for all political parties to commit to comprehensive, independent review of tax of Canada's review, tax review system. And it, it cannot be politicized. It has to be for all parties to come together to work in the best interest of Canadians. But Mr. To Greco, make this answer me this question: Why is Galen Weston have a lower marginal effective uh, tax rate? than a plumber, a teacher, a nurse, a welder in my community. And how is that fair? Again, again at the end of the day, we have to look at generational fairness, that we have to consider the actions that we want today. Do we want future prosperity? Do we want economic opportunity to be for the benefits of Canadians? If we don't have jobs, if we don't have prosperity, if we don't have investment in Canada, then it affects all Canadians and it affects our ability for Canadians to get what they need at the end of the Mr. day. Mr. Greco, is it a good thing is it a good thing? I'm going to ask you some questions. Is it a good thing that, that we introduced a child care plan that is saving moms and dads, employees that are working for the companies that you represent $10,000 a year on average? Is that a good thing? And also because of that child care, they, they're able to take that job or able to go to school and improve their skills. Is that a good thing for your organizations and the companies you represent, that child care plan? I, I think you know, there, have, there have, yes, there have been positive Steps have been taken with government in terms of child care. So and doesn't other, it make sense may, to may ask? So doesn't it make sense to ask the wealthiest, the wealthiest in Canada, to pay a little bit more so that we can continue to provide child care and save moms and dads ten thousand dollars a year on I the think cost it, of child care? Is that again, not fair? Is, I, that, not, I think is again, that not a good thing? I, again, I think you have to look at simplifying the tax system. We can't we can't have a reliance on tax and spend politics. It undermines growth, it undermines investment, and it, un it undercuts future generations. When we look at fairness, if we do comprehensive tax reform properly, that will allow us to for the benefit of all Canadians. Thank you very much. Um, does the Chamber of Commerce have a position or a perspective on the impact of widening wealth and income inequality in Canada? We want equality for all. At the end of the day, there has to be, equal there has to be equality and fairness for all. And do any of the policies that you've been advocating for today contribute to greater equality when it comes to wealth, inequality, wealth equality or income equality? We always, all our policies that we put forward are for the, you know, are the interests of all Canadians. Yes, we, we are a business organization. We, yes, we are a business organization, but we, everything that we put forward as an organization is about for the prosperity of all Canadians and to ensure that um, Can Canadians' interests are protected. But cer certain kinds of growth, for instance, uh, contribute to greater inequality. And so 
you know, the World Bank has expressed concern that if that's the direction that com- countries go in, they're not going to be able to sustain that growth and they're not going to be able to sustain social stability because widening inequality is corrosive on society. And we've seen that all around the world. I, I guess specific to this issue of, because this is the, this is the question when it comes to capital gains, this is the, the nub of the issue, is um, that the tax code and the way that we've structured taxes have worsened the issue of income and wealth equality in this country. And, and so trying to reverse that means making changes to, to make it better. I, do you not support those changes, given what we know about make, inequality? Making changes, that's why I've talked about earlier in my, in my, I'll repeat it again, is that's why comprehensive tax reform is important to focus on best outcomes, not only for businesses to grow, but to help for the prosperity for all Canadians. If we don't have jobs, we have no investment, we don't have growing communities, and we don't, and we're not improving our standard around the world. Are any of the tax reforms that your organization advocates for uh, connected to reducing wealth and income inequality? And is there any evidence uh, that you can table that we we are focused on equality and fairness for all Canadians? Equality Thank and fairness for all Canadians. Very much, okay. uh, Mr. Moretz, please. Uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Greco, I wanted to uh, spend a little more time on Mr. Beatty's letter because it's quite interesting. He says um, the part where he talks about um, the um, uh, th- that uh, the inclusion rates uh, will only affect a small number of Canadians is misleading. He goes on to say one in five Canadian companies are likely to be directly impacted over the next 10 years, and the effects of this tax hike will be borne by all Canadians, directly or indirectly, either through diminishing uh, creation of new companies and jobs, reducing the availability of medical practitioners, eroding pension returns, altering the delicate risk-reward balance of countless investments, or threatening the retirement plans of millions of Canadians who pin their plans on the proceeds of selling a family cottage or a small business grown over a lifetime. It's a pretty damning statement about the government's plan. Would you agree with the characterization that this is economic vandalism on the part of the Liberal government? I think think at the end of the day, though, it goes back to, again, we need to have... well, this is a non-partisan comment I want to stress, that we need to have fairness in the tax system for all for all Canadians. And right now, I think, again, when you have tax and spends carve-out policies, that just is a signal to the rest of the world. What do we do in terms of investment in Canada? Yeah. And speaking of fairness, I want to return back to this example because I don't think we spent enough time on it. Uh, my colleagues around this table, other than the Conservatives, don't seem to recognize that a small business can be incorporated like the example I gave of the hair salon that's a sole proprietorship, right next door to the hair salon uh, that happens to be uh, incorporated. Just a small company that maybe they went to a lawyer to do up for them so they could rent space through a company, maybe because they want to limit their liability, like people do. Those two people are treated differently. How, how is that fair? I think again. I think at the end of the day, there has to there has to be fairness for all for all Canadians. And I just think that when we we it can't we can't be pinning groups against one or the other. It has to be fair for all. And and I think that and I think that's a challenge. With when we have these different policies, it sh- it shouldn't be dividing people. We have to be able to unite people in order to ensure that not only businesses thrive but also Canadians thrive as well. Mr. Beatty goes on to say that the tax hike will only undermine the government's stated policy objectives, bolstering health care and dental care, attracting and retaining skilled professionals, increasing investment innovation, and helping small businesses thrive. So uh, you couldn't have a more damning position uh, of the government's policy, and yet it seems to be falling on deaf ears. Now, I was heartened to hear you say earlier that before the implementation legislation is tabled that the Canadian Chamber of Commerce will be acting being proactive about yeah. this, and hopefully that enough pressure will come over the summer, like it did with the uh, over the nighttime uh, in the dark of night changes to the Tossie rules back in 2017 that the government ended up having to back off on. Uh, I suspect that a similar thing is going to happen over the summer when businesses, small businesses, wake up and realize that they're getting screwed over by the government again. Um, but do you believe that? Um, uh, uh, the Chamber of Commerce will be mounting uh, an exercise to. 
push the government into withdrawing these changes? Let's continue with advocate. Our position is our position that was in the letter, and we continue to push advocacy for those changes. Thank you very much. But one thing I would like your reflection on, Mr. Uh, Greco, is that uh, there are some, there should be some rules about rollover. Okay, so you realize a capital gain, but you turn right around and you reinvest it. What kind of um, uh, advice would you give to the government about how to construct those rules so that somebody who's making an honest effort to build a business and using the proceeds of their investments, etc., uh, don't necessarily get swept up in this? Yeah, I think one of the things that would just help with productivity, so if you look at Atlanta, Canada, for example, they introduced an investment tax credit of 10% to help improve, like with uh, reinvesting machinery equipment, uh, environmental performance, and other avenues to help out, like with what we're talking about, to address productivity. I think look at that and having you know specific measures where it's easy for small businesses to be able to invest in that would help, but also making sure there are strict rules so nobody gets swept into you know different car uh, different challenges would be, I think, one thing. Secondly, though, from my perspective, again, I think the simplest way is what I talked about in my remarks is look at these reforms, the regulatory system, and look at the tax system. That would just go a long way to improve our productivity numbers. Thanks, Mr. Hardy. Uh, Mrs. Block, please. Thank you, Chair, and I do appreciate the opportunity to have a round of questioning, even though I've only been here for the last hour. I would have to say it's a bit ironic that today's study on regulatory modernization was put forward by the Liberals on this committee with a view to doing a few things, which is reducing the unnecessary administrative burden on medium, on small and medium-sized businesses, simplifying regulatory processes, cutting red tape. And lastly, examining regulations that may impede international competitiveness, and yet here we are. They've introduced yet another, what I would call vacuous policy, with their increase in capital gains that is going to have a huge impact on the members you represent. I think I've heard that in the short time that I've been here today. And, and put that together with the carbon tax that is already hurting small and medium-sized si medium businesses and, and the increases that are going to be contemplated all along the way. I know, uh, Mr. Greco, that you had asked to return to this committee, that you've been here before, provided some testimony and asked if you could come back, and you, you said there were some things that you wanted to address. Um, I'm... If I'm covering ground that was already covered in the first hour, I, 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 I don't want to do that. But I'm, I'm thinking that you probably talked a lot about the capital gains uh, policy of this current government. Is there anything that you would, that is really pressing that you would like to share with us um, today, given that you had asked to return? Yeah, and also, just for to be also clear, I know Mr. McCauley had mentioned that uh, he wanted uh, myself and others back in June, just given the fact that we didn't get into hard thing. I think what we, I think one thing I really want to highlight is what's been done in Br going back to regulatory reform is what's been happening in British Columbia. Like, so what they did is look at having a Minister of Deregulation, and that kind of helped separate to really put a focus on red tape. And then government agencies had to work on tracking and reporting regulatory activity against the baseline. Furthermore, agencies were put on a regulatory diet where they, in addition to looking at measurement and monitoring, they had to commit to reducing regulatory requirements by one-third. And so that was tied into agencies being having to demonstrate, you know, why regulations would be introduced in exchange for any new regulations. New regulations that were introduced held greater scrutiny to demonstrate, you know, how many regulations would be eliminated, but also focus on outcomes-based measures, evidence, a risk-based approach focusing on outcomes. Reform was decentralized where each agency was responsible for tracking and reporting and monitoring progress. Why I mention this is we're looking at reforms to what Treasury Board is doing. These are things that we have to keep in mind, and especially when regarding to consultation. It, you know, uh, yes, one and done consultation has been talked about, but it's also looking at roadmaps and looking at that progress. And if there isn't those proper work plans in place, then we don't have authentic consultation. It's going to be like, okay, we talked about it, and then we moved on. Like, I think we really, with this study, we don't want this to be a study and just to sit, sit on, a pay, uh, on a study we'd like we're done. Like there needs to be this reform and we have to move it forward. Otherwise, we're spinning our wheel, or we're, frankly, we're spinning our wheels. Thank you very much. 
Do I have any time left? Yeah, a minute and a half. A minute and a half. I want to turn back to the Red Tape Reduction Act and the fact that um, at the last uh, meeting we had around this, we had some, some witnesses around the table that weren't necessarily very familiar with some of the... Um, some of the requirements in that act on the part of uh, the government and, and the president of the Treasury Board um, to table an annual report on federal regulatory management initiatives and to provide an update on, on what the government is doing. And have you heard from many of your members on, on this issue that um, they, they may not have a full understanding about what is required of this government when it comes to the act and um, given your mandate in representing your members is there any advice you would provide to us on that front that's a that's a great question i think generally there's a lot of education that needs to be done still and it goes back to explaining what different initiatives are in plain language but part of that too when you're explaining we talk about cost benefit analysis all the time that yes, there's, it's based on data made available in terms of regulatory impact analysis, what's available on StatsCAM, but it's really going into how this affects businesses. They have to deal with different things in terms of compliance, cost, operational cost, payroll, other technical requirements. That also all has to be accounted for. Otherwise, if an initiative is put forward in terms of the Red Tape Reduction Act, there's not accountability. It's not really painting the whole picture. It has to look at everything. Economic, environmental, societal considerations. Otherwise, um, we're not looking at what is not only the best interest for businesses, but we're also not looking at what is the best interest for Canadians. Thanks very much. Mr. Sousa, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, my question is to Laura Jones. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the, the regulatory bodies. And there's been a lot of chatter um, from opposing views that Politicians should be the one making decisions, it seems, when it comes to matters in case of, of uh, regulatory matters like provincial um, regulatory affairs uh, around um, securities law. Sometimes I've seen certain politicians get into the, um, the decision making of um, a securities regulator, especially when it comes across innovative engagement. Um, the Bank of Canada, for example, is another area where politicians are making claims that they want to be the governor um, and promote f other forms of currency, it seems. And I'm just wondering from your vantage point, how do you see the integrity of the system, especially that of Canadian and the regulatory side and the legitimate side? I mean, people come to Canada for certain reasons, and one of them is that they're safe from interference. I'd I'm, 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 I'm like to know your thoughts on the arm's length relationships of regulatory authorities. I think we're fortunate to live in a country where we have, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, good institutions and standards around that. And of course, um, important that we're always uh, mindful of that and having healthy debates and conversations about that is part of it. But respecting those boundaries, you mentioned the one between the Bank of Canada and Paul. I mean, there are, there are healthy boundaries that have been set up for good reasons and respecting that is important. We certainly didn't hear a lot about of concern about that, if that's your question, um, with uh, respect to the people who were coming to talk to us at the the external advisory committee on regulatory um, competitiveness. There, um, that was that wasn't that wasn't high on the list of things that people were were that wasn't on the list. In fact, I don't think we had anyone raise that specifically. I mean, yeah, I am concerned about competitiveness. I think Paul, all of us wants to to lessen the cumulative burden of regulatory initiatives, but in order to, for our companies and institutions. To be competitive, especially when they're competing with other parts of the world. I think that's one of the reasons we're having this discussion. Um, but there's some safety codes that we want. There are voluntary standards that are provided by industry. And I think sometimes we equate that to regulatory issues. Are you? Do you distinguish between those? 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to be a little bit more nuanced about this. It isn't always the case that reducing regulatory burdens is going to increase competitiveness. In some cases, our competitiveness is enhanced by the fact that people have a lot of faith in um, Canadian products being safe and um, healthy. And I know that gets advertised, for example, in Asian uh, markets around some of our fishery and agriculture products. That's a huge competitive advantage. They come from Canada, a country that's known for its health and safety. So, um, But at the same time, we can't always equate more rules with more safety either. So it's it's finding that regulatory excellence. I, I, I agree with you. I, I believe that's a fine balance in order to protect um, people's safety while being competitive. Mr. Greco, in 2008, we had a huge inter- um, global financial meltdown. How did you feel about Canada during that time? How did you feel about our financial institutions during that time of that, that, that downturn? Yeah, like at our time, I think, you know, our financial institutions were resilient. I think we're resilient. I think it was, you know, through a bipartisan effort of what happened with like uh, efforts of the Ontario government, the federal government as well, getting out. It was as a result of the efforts, I think, in a nonpartisan way, got us out of that uh, financial crisis. And we had a, certainly a manufacturing crisis and we had to renew yep. and to re- and regroup and bring back a lot of employment. And we did. In fact, we a lot more employment came back. A lot more manufacturing was reinvested into um, into Canada, and especially in the auto industry, uh, because of some of the collaboration of governments and in regulatory affairs when it came to protecting the financial services industry and consumers. Do you agree with that? I think I remember in Ontario when we did pension reform, for example, that was, that was definitely uh, I think you know a positive step in the right direction. But I think though, Mr. Souza, that that there was challenges with manufacturing though. You know, in, 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 even going back as far as even like four or five, six years ago, like it hasn't it wasn't all perfect either in terms of the loss of manufacturing jobs and also we were at in terms of sustained economic growth. And I'm talking so about that's the re- our time. I'm afraid recovery. Mr. Sousa.